I'm the eldest of five children. Right, okay. I broke up in a very dysfunctional family. There was <laughs> a lot of alcoholism and abuse going on behind the scenes. Right, okay. Um, if, I'm, if, if, if I'm brutally honest. Yeah, that okay. you've you've had various kind of ups and downs with. So how, how did you kind of control your different emotional kind of sides throughout that phase of your life? Well, initially I didn't. I ignored right. it. So in 2013, okay. It was in 2013, so I was 27 years old when I had my brain hemorrhage. Right, okay. Uh, and I remember sitting in the corner and I was literally rocking like a baby, crying to myself, like a complete breakdown. And yeah, yeah that's when I, I got a bike and I basically tied my foot to, foot to the pedal, my hand to hand bar, and I pedalled about 100, and worked out about 120 miles. Um, wow. All the way from Warwickshire through to Cambridgeshire to my friend's house. Wow. And, but it was that wake up call I needed. Something, you know, for everyone. Everyone will hit a really massive low in their life at some point. Yep. There'll be some people that go, no, I'm fine. I'm yep. fine. But there will be a moment where you hit a low and yeah. someone or something will, will give you that, give you, almost snap you out of it. Right. that was that was the wow moment because it wasn't winning anything great i came yeah. to the bottom of the list in the end but i knew what i could do yeah yeah yeah. And yeah in that year of turnaround obviously i became the uh, paralympic world champion and um <laughs> and first gold medalist yeah. so. so early on in my competing career i had like i said i had nothing to lose it was right it was, okay you know, I just did it. But yeah. once you reach the top of it as well, yeah. that's where the stress actually begins because suddenly you've got to stay there. You've got, <laughs> everyone's chasing for that little bit of that glory. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, right, how do I do that? And okay. when I came out of Rio, I was like, I was on it. I was ready to go again. And it's tough, but if you want something and you really want something, once yeah. you know what you want, yeah. go for it. Yeah, and if it doesn't that. work, you don't enjoy it. If you stop enjoying something, you've got to yeah. move on. Yeah. Okay. So we're absolutely delighted and extremely honoured today to welcome an incredible lady who shot to fame as a cyclist during the 2016 UCI Paracycling Track World Championships where she won gold medals in the individual pursuit and time trial event, becoming a double world champion and setting new world records in both. So it's with great pleasure to welcome Megan Gillier, MBE, to the show to share her secrets and sacrifices of her professional journey so far and much, much more. So Megan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for spending the time with us because I know uh, I know you're mega, mega busy from conversations that we've uh, that we've had. Uh, which I'm sure we'll get into in the show. Um, however, before we start, so the listeners can get to know you just a little bit better, my children have come up with 10 quick fire, would you rather questions. And because it's a family portrait, we have Harper, we have Mason and Sebastian asking you the questions today. So I'm going to pass you over to Mason and he's going to start us off. Would you rather game or read a book? Like, you know what? I, I should say read a book, shouldn't I? <laughs> I like a sneaky game every so often. Yeah, I do like to game. What's your favourite like game to play? At the moment, I'm playing Witcher and Red Dead Redemption 2. Ooh. So I do love those. I, I want that game. Is that what whatever. you want, Sebastian? <laughs> I was going to yeah, say, I'm, you're probably too young for it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of that one. I'm, I'm sorry. That went over my head. <laughs> Would you rather win a million or earn a million? Earn a million. That way I know, but I put the hard work in and everything. I, I really worked for that. I know, but I deserve it. Brilliant answer. Love that. Would you rather have takeaway or eat out? Probably eat eat out. Oh, do you know what? I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't. Do you know what? I can't taste. So when I eat food... I make all the sounds and all the ums or I want this because everyone else has got it and I've got food envy. But I don't actually <laughs> enjoy eating because oh, bless of it. You. Right, so okay. I suppose a takeaway means I can do it with my family nicely. Actually, let's go for eat out. We'll go for eat out, you know what? Eat, eat out. out. <laughs> Would you rather explore the ocean or space? 
ocean definitely the ocean absolutely fascinated okay. what what's your favorite like sea animal oh sorry you just broke up there you're, you're <laughs> breaking up a little bit uh, mace, mason mason yeah no mason just asked if you got a favorite sea animal oh yeah sharks sharks, um, sharks all the way <laughs> what would yours be mace uh not sure Pro probably a shark as well sharks <laughs> okay you ready harps yeah would you rather wear nike or adidas uh adidas uh would you rather own a ferrari or lamborghini lambo Ooh. yeah lambo what would be your favorite car you know what? I'm more a motorbike person, if I'm truly Ooh, honest. I cool. loved, I love my Suzuki Bandit and my um, Kawasaki Ninja when I had it. Wow, so, cool. Yeah. Oh. So, we could say a Bugatti Diva if you like. We'll go for one of those, shall we? Something a bit different. Nice, nice. Never Would a Ford one. Dine with Dame Sarah Story or Trisha Zoo. Or no, Zorn. Mm -hmm. uh, Dame Sarah Story. I, I, I get on quite well with her anyway, so. Yeah, All right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we thought you might have a link with her anyway, so we wasn't we wasn't too sure whether you'd say uh, Trisha. <laughs> Would you rather be too hot or too cold? Oh, sorry, Harper, you broke up. A bit of Would signal you issue, I think. Be too hot or too cold? Um, too cold because you can always put layers on. Plus, I love going to bed cold and then warming up and feeling nice and toasty. If you're too hot in bed, cooling down is a nightmare. <laughs> Would you rather um, listen to pop music or R and B music? Mm, I think there's a bit more flexibility in pop music, actually. Not that I'm much of a pop fan, but I'm, I'm very eclectic when it comes to music. We'll go for pop. Pop music. Last one, Mace. Would you rather play Black Widow or Captain Marvel in a Marvel film? Black Widow. <laughs> Any day. No hesitation there. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could do those moves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very much for that, guys. Are you going to say bye-bye to, um, to Megan now? Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Thank you, too. All right. Thank you Catch very you later. much, guys. <laughs> oh, they're epic. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for that, Megan. So, uh, so just for the listeners and for the viewers at home, uh, Mason mentioned about Dame Sarah's story. She's... She's one of the most successful British Paralympians of all time with 14 gold medals uh, across swimming and cycling, whereas Trisha Zorn um, is probably the, one of the most famous Paralympic athletes, grabbing a whopping 55 medals in total with 41 golds. And we thought that was probably something that would resonate with you super well um, with all the kind of hard work and dedication and resilience required to achieve such greatness, obviously, because you've been on that journey as well. So... The, the children were uh, were quite kind of interested and keen to see what uh, answers you give to them. So thank you for answering them today for them. Okay, so no um, so let's begin the show. So so as you know, the podcast is to shine the light on the the secrets and sacrifices all families go through to allow their children to become elite level athletes, and that's something really close to our hearts. With having four children currently on that journey. Um, so, so we're always curious to hear what family life and the background surrounding the athlete was like and whether any of this shaped their journeys of where they are today. So could you just take me back to when you was kind of growing up at home and what your childhood was like when you was growing up? Well, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm the eldest of five children. Right, okay. I broke up in a very dysfunctional family. There was <laughs> a lot of alcoholism and abuse going on behind the scenes. Right, okay. Um, if, 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 if I'm brutally honest. Yeah, okay. Um, but my early days, I was brought up on a farm and on small holdings, and we moved around quite wow. a lot. Right, okay. But I, I do remember the really fun bits of it, and I really right. love that. Yeah, but What's yeah. really interesting is that my family, none of my family are actually into sport. See, that was going to be one of my questions that I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you if you came from a sporty, um, sporty background. <laughs> yeah, I uh, right. because I came from a dysfunctional family and um, alcoholism was involved. I always strove as a, as a child growing up. I didn't like it. I didn't right, like okay. the I was treading on eggshells. I was always yep. trying to keep my mum happy and safe. Okay. Yeah. And it was, it's a, it, it was a very volatile environment. You never knew what was going to happen from one day to the next. Now, okay. like I said, I grew up on a farm and I, there were some really happy memories. Right, but okay. what I did know is that I didn't want to be like my family. 
Right, okay. So yeah. I think as a child, I mentally disengaged and I purposely made myself very different. So right, I've never okay. touched drink. I've never touched yeah. drugs. I've never smoked. Wow. Um, I okay. like sports. Yeah, None of yeah. my family likes sports. So that's exactly what I did. I also am a massive animal lover, which right. my mum was anyway. So right, okay. I think got something from her there. Yeah, um, yeah. But okay. for me, yeah, I, I, sport was my get out. Sport, okay. That's yeah. how I got into that. And, yeah. and, family life was like i love my siblings so we yep. are not as strange as such but we live a very different different lives different worlds right fact, okay i've got one of my sisters staying with me at the moment right um, okay quite, so a couple of my sisters yeah yeah so we do have a bond yeah um, but very, we're very individual right people. okay so what what are the what sports did you do at school then megan absolutely anything everything when i was a was kid yep. i aimed to please my pe teachers right anything. okay I would yeah. hang on my PE teachers everywhere. <laughs> that okay. It was my life. And I always found it so incredibly hard when yeah. I, I was never, I was never great. Well, I wasn't naturally great. I had to really work at it to be good. Right. And, okay. But I never gave up either. Okay. But it was always incredibly hard because there was always this one golden boy that was just amazing at sports. <laughs> <laughs> everything i was like i want to be him it's not fair i want right, to be okay. him. i want to be that good yeah and okay it really pushed me right um, okay but my main sports so my main sports were rugby cricket right. when i was younger yeah um and swimming so they're right, my okay. main sports um, and then i okay. was introduced to squash and so my mum did um, put me into private squash lessons for a little while i really enjoyed right, okay. it okay okay so from, from an early age, would you say that to become, say, a professional athlete was on your kind of radar then? Or was it something that you just really just like enjoyed doing the sports, like you said, and you, you was, it sounds like you was always just striving to be like kind of the best and kind of succeed and, and like you said, to be a little bit different. So was that on your radar then or, or would you say not? No, I don't think it was. So for me, like to be fair, I didn't even know what the Olympics was. As a kid, I never watched the Olympics. Right, okay. The Paralympics, I think the first one I ever actually engaged in was in 2012, which was just prior to my, wow. my, my brain hemorrhage and stroke. Before yeah, that, yeah. I wasn't really aware of it. I was in a very close, I was in a very, cl being brought up a, being brought up on a farm in the middle of nowhere to start off with. I didn't actually move into like the city or into towns until I was about 14. I was very okay. close off from the outside world. We weren't really allowed to watch TV very often. Right, my okay. mum would actually pull the plug off so we couldn't watch TV and had to go out and play in the fields, which right, actually okay. I really am thankful for uh, yeah. as, a, as an adult. As okay. a child, I was a bit, probably a bit stroppy about that. I was like, why can't I watch it? I don't even know what my <laughs> friends at school are going on about. What is Bless this? <laughs> um, so for me, it was very, I was kind of in a very sheltered world, world as well in some ways. Right, um, okay. Because they weren't sport orientated, it was never something that was on the TV or spoken about. It wasn't, we didn't really have newspapers to hand for it unless we we're using it as bedding and shaving, you know, shavings and stuff for our animals. Right, so okay. So I was really quite blissfully unaware. I just did sport because I loved it. Just and right, because oh, okay. I didn't really yeah i didn't i didn't necessarily uh, competed i just like i liked it i liked it but didn't yeah. wasn't fussed if i won or lost as a child right okay and was that one of the reasons that you got into um say like your multi-sports coaching uh when you was older because we'd we'd read that you you got into multi-sports coaching and you specialized in rugby and gymnastics uh, was that kind of the reasoning behind that because you loved all your sports and and that's what you wanted that was like kind of one of your passions at the time <laughs> Yeah, so when I left school, um, it was a really, it was a lifeguarding was an easy fix and a really yeah. good one. And actually, for my eldest child, he I pushed him into lifeguarding because right. he could instantly get get a career and get into that sporting environment. He wasn't sporty like me, unfortunately. Right. Um, okay. He liked he liked being active. Yeah. Very much on his terms, very solo kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. And. For me, I did lifeguarding, and from there I got opportunities in coaching. And for me, I was an achiever. I like yeah. to achieve a certificate. Give me a certificate any day. Yeah. Right, so okay. if I could get my hands on a certificate, I was doing whatever it was, and I was being the best I could be in that moment. So right, I became okay. a lifeguard, and from there I got opportunities to become a trampoline coach and a swimming instructor and an aerobics instructor, and all these different Ooh. elements kind of started to pull together. Right, okay. Um, and as I went through life and was jumping from one job to another, so I went into – I did go into teaching – Right. Okay. Um, but yep. I also was in the police force for a short while. Right. But everything always came back to sports or working in. I worked in the kennels for a short period of time as well. And right. Okay. Okay. Um, but for me, everything always came back down to sport. I right. Always back to sports. 
Um, right. And I think it was my lifeline. It was always something that I enjoyed. I could build up energy and I could do loads of different things as well. It wasn't necessarily focused on one one particular element. Right. OK, because it was it was at your time when you was doing your multi sports coaching um, where you started suffering um, fainting spells at work and you sought uh, medical advice and it revealed um, a bleed on your spinal uh, fluid and further ch- tests showed uh, a bleed on your brain, which required surgery. Um, and then you wonder when you cranial Tommy, uh, um, you woke from the surgery from about two weeks to induced coma. Um, I've got a long list of things here that I will read off for you now. So, uh, you lost the function to the right side of your body. It reduced your speech and your memory loss. Um, you went into intensive rehab. Uh, you found everyday simple tasks quite kind of difficult to do independently. Uh, a few months later, you was diagnosed with epilepsy. Um, then you kind of fell into a little bit of depression. Um, and then it was at a time where, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, we read uh, it was a time where you were sleeping at uh, a friend's house. And I think you were sleeping there for about three weeks. And it was after talking to your friend's mother who had terminal cancer, um, who you said she kind of placed things into perspective for you. And she was saying that she gave you that kind of focus and that drive back to do something for yourself. Um, and she told you to, to kind of find a sport and to be the best at it that you can be. And obviously, uh, you, you, you definitely kind of did that in the end. Um, so then you started researching different sports to join and you attended uh, a paracycling selection camp. Um, and then the rest is history, they kind of say. Um, so could you just give us a little bit of an insight into what was going through your mind at the time? Because that must that obviously that was a, a massive like kind of life changing experience for you um, that you've that you've had various kind of ups and downs with. So how how did you kind of control your different emotional kind of sides throughout that phase of your life? Well, initially I didn't. I ignored right. it all. So in twenty thirteen, okay. it was in twenty thirteen. So I was twenty seven years old when I had my brain hemorrhage. Right. Okay. And there was a lot of uh, I, I think I was I was I was in a reasonably new relationship at the time which fe- did it obviously fell apart it right, wasn't okay. you know like she was there every day but I was in hospital and she tried to show that support but it's just it's just too much early on and I completely understand why it fell apart right okay and but yep. during it was very hard so when I went through that there were so many emotional ups and downs and I was being misunderstood and I was having to regain my memories but I'd lost and work out what memories were real and what were false as well because obviously right, okay. I was having to work out through asking other people and getting their their memories and for me that that's not how that probably wasn't my memory at all you know right okay so I had to deal with that but the yep. big the big the big struggle was when I came out of hospital because yep. I self discharged against the medical experts advice about two months into the um, <laughs> it's about two months after Right, the okay. initial operation yeah and I was sat around a medical table with all these medical professionals so like an occupational therapist a physiotherapist a psychologist wow. a general doctor person a neurologist yep. all these people and they they basically sat me down with it with my my partner at the time um and and basically were saying that I was what well, well, how I interpreted it was I was crap I wasn't ready. I was. I wasn't able to look after myself, and I'd lost all my independence in that moment. Yeah. And I remember yeah. crying, and I couldn't control my emotions either. So wow. my face would like tell everything I was doing, even though I was trying to say, "No, I'm fine." You know, yeah. I'd be yeah. blubbering away, and I must have been looked awful. But for me, I felt, I felt, I felt um, embarrassed. I felt yeah. ashamed. I felt like I'd lost my complete independence. I'd lost yeah. everything I'd worked so hard to prove I wasn't as well. Yeah. Because yeah. I was having to rely on people for support and help. Yeah. And that was huge for me. I massive amounts of pride that I had to get over and had to work through and just, just, just deal with it. You yeah. know, when you're on the hospital bed and can't move for yourself and you're in ICU and you've got a tube down your throat, but you're kind of aware of things going on, you just have to let it happen. There's nothing yeah. you can do and you've lost your dignity yeah. and it is a really horrible place to be. So I fought against them, all the medical professionals and said, I'm one out of here. I don't okay. want to stay here anymore. Yeah. And yeah. I went home okay. and I went home over a bank holiday. Um, right in of april i think it was okay um, bank holiday week and there's bank holiday weekends and they couldn't get any medical professionals out to me and i was by my, myself and wow. my partner work and i was suddenly in this massive like barn farmhouse thing yeah. in the middle of nowhere can't really walk with a wheelchair yeah 
and I had I was by myself and I was left with my thoughts in this silence. Yeah. And now in hospital, I was one of the fast, one of the quickest recoveries, really. You know, I was one the, I was the youngest there, definitely. I was definitely the youngest there on the ward. And I was I was doing well, you know, and I, I, because I had other people, I was, it's almost like a competition, I suppose, in your head, and you don't realise it, but yeah. you're using those milestones, you're like, right, I'm gonna do that. They can't do it, I'm gonna do that. <laughs> Very yeah. different stories, very different backgrounds, but I'm yeah. going to beat it anyway. Yeah. And when I got home, suddenly there was nothing and I couldn't do anything. And and I remember sitting in the corner and I was literally rocking like a baby, crying to myself, like a complete breakdown. Wow. And I had psychologists coming over and counsellors and stuff eventually and work, trying to work through things. And I really didn't feel like I was being listened to and that they were thinking that because of the brain hemorrhage and the stroke that I was misinterpreting what I was seeing and what I was feeling and what I was hearing from other people. Okay. And it took time for them to realise that actually what I was saying in, you know, even though they thought maybe it was because of the stroke, they yeah. actually were starting to realise that actually, no, what she's saying is is truthful and actually it makes sense. And no wonder she's feeling the way she does. And it was hard, but I had to prove myself to people because people were were saying that I couldn't think for myself and that, you know, it was yeah. like, like I'd lo- I completely lost any control of my life. Okay. And I had judgments. I felt so judged by people. Yeah. And I didn't like that at all. Right. And that's when I went to my friend's house and I actually tied my foot to a pedal and my hand to a handlebar because at the time I couldn't use it at all. I can use it now. It yeah. goes a bit crawly sometimes right. uh, and stops, but other times it works fine. It just depends on whether I'm thinking about it. I kind of yeah. got on my side just don't even know it's there half the time. You know, it's just it's just something that hangs there a lot of the time if right. I'm not thinking about it. Okay. Same walking. I have to really think about those steps to walk. If I don't think about it, suddenly my right side drops off. It's very, right. very, okay. very weird. Hard, hard to explain. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, that's when I I got a bike and I basically tied my foot to, foot to the pedal, and my hand to a handlebar, and I pedaled about hundred. Worked out about 120 miles um, wow. all the way from Warwickshire through to Cambridgeshire to my friend's house. Wow. And like you said, when I was there, I I spoke to her mum. And she, yep. she kind of gave me a bit of a talking to, you know, as I'm wallowing <laughs> on the sofa, stinking the place out, probably trying to be helpful and embarrassed that I can't actually do anything for myself, Yeah. Um, which I did actually do stuff for myself. It's just at the time, your brain tells yep. you otherwise. And I had to really fight through it. But it right. was that wake up call I needed. Something, okay. you know, for everyone, everyone will hit a really massive low in their life at some point. Yep. There'll be some people that go, no, I'm fine. Absolutely yep. fine. But there will be a moment where you hit a low. And yeah. someone or something will will give you that, give you almost snap you out of it. Yeah, and, yeah. And that's what I needed. I needed that realization check almost just to go, look, stop. What are you good at? What do you like? I don't yeah. know anymore. This is what you used to like. Go yeah. for it. Do it. Right. Don't let other people stop you. Prove yeah. to them that you can do this stuff. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. What I went and did. <laughs> wow. And, and, and you know, and... It should, and it also made me realize that actually how grateful I should be for my life because yeah. I got a second chance. You know, yeah. my friend's mum. She she knew she didn't have long to live, and yet there she was giving me the advice. And I, in that moment, I felt so. I suppose it, I don't know if it's guilt, but I just felt so ashamed that I was even. In a way, I felt like I, I shouldn't have even put it on her. Yeah, yeah. But I yeah. think I had completely was blissfully unaware because I was so wrapped up in my own little world and everything that was going on in me. Yeah. I just get blindsided. Yeah. And I need yeah. that. I need that. Wow. Feeling. Okay, so again, we've had we've had a number of guests on. I mean, we've had um, say Freya Levy on. Um, mm. So she's um, wheelchair uh, professional uh, Team GB professional wheelchair basketballer. She does um, para ice hockey. She also does the rugby sevens. She had uh, mus- muscular dystrophy when she was younger. Um, and then we had Jay Lelliot, a Team GB swimmer. He's had a couple of brain tumors when he was younger as well. We've had loads of different guests. Um, that have all had various kind of personal uh, things that have kind of happened to them. Um, but I think it just shows the kind of the mindset and the mentality, the resilience and intrinsic motivation that like the athletes like yourself like have to kind of go through something like that and kind of flip it around into a kind of a positive with like, obviously you're saying that you've been given a second chance um, mm-hmm. from speaking to like kind of your friend's um, uh, mum. So... I like said, like the the mindset of uh, an, a professional athlete is honestly it's, it's unbelievable, and and the things that you've done since then have just been absolutely incredible. Uh, when we was reading up on them, so so when you started your journey, um, what would you say was your say first wow moment? So I know we had Freya on not so long ago, um, and it was at a time where 
Um, she played at the Copper Box Arena. Uh, it was against Spain, and she she was playing in front of about seven and a half thousand um, people, and she got like a free throw. Um, she made it, and the crowd went like kind of bonkers. Um, and then we had like Darcy Mead on. Um, she's a uh, Team GB Alpine skier. Um, and it was when she um, participated in the Youth Olympic Festival. And she said everything from going to the airport um, to like kind of the hotel to receiving all the uniform to doing like kind of the interviews when she was only about 16 or 17 at the time. Mm -hmm. um, they, they just spoke so like kind of glowingly and it almost kind of gave them goosebumps again with that first kind of wow moment. Can you remember your first wow moment in the, in the sport? Well, other than my first time of getting on a track bike after having a stroke and thinking, oh my God, this is lethal, but I am <laughs> one of my coaches. He's going to lose all of his hair with me. Um, yeah. My wow moment was probably my debut my debut ride at World right, Championships. Okay. It was the yeah. year, it was 2015. This was the year before the Paralympic Games. Right, um, okay. You know, I got into cycling, not for the gold medal. It was like, it was that intrinsic motivation. It's what did I want to have it? It was just to yeah. push myself. And I didn't really realise the, um, the the severity, the grandness, the, yeah. the, the everything that the all-encompassing world of cycling. I didn't really realise and take it in. Yeah. Okay. I started. All I focused on was I was using cycling. I was going to prove to everyone that I was the best and yeah. that I can get myself better and I'm fine. Yeah. You know, yeah. and it was all about my like, physical health and my mental health and really yeah. focusing on all of that and getting into a really regimented routine to get yeah. there. Right. And okay. when I went for my debut ride, I remember riding and I was the first rider up. So in cycling, um, the crappiest rider goes first, basically. <laughs> and I didn't know this. I was blissfully unaware. But I had okay. nothing to lose. I'd never won a medal before. So for me, oh, I'd, had, I'd won some national ones by then because it's like obviously they put me through much, you know, seeing where I was at. Yeah. But that didn't mean too much to me. I was just riding because I love riding and I was, I was getting better and better. So I knew that my physical health and my mental health was getting better and better with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when yeah. I went for my debut ride, I went first and I was like, whoa, this is doable. I'm at the top of the list. I'm first. <laughs> and I sit there I'm looking at the screen as everyone else does their ride. And I'm not focused on the other riders because you can only do the best you can do in an individual. Yeah sport in that respect yeah and once you once the team's worked around you and helped get you to that line it's up to you and you you do the best you can do and you leave it out there on the track yeah and then you sit there and you watch and then I watched my name just drop down as every rider did a faster time and I realized I was shit still but I didn't actually think like that what I saw is I want to be that number one I've seen yeah. my name there and watched it come down and now I want it yeah now okay. I actually want the medal and yeah. that that was a real um a real eye opener for me because right, okay. um I don't think I realised how good or how quickly I I moved up. I didn't I didn't really take it in. I just right. was just living. I was yeah, living yeah. and I was enjoying what I was doing for once in my life again. I was just right. starting to live again and breathe. And right. that was that was the wow moment because it wasn't winning anything great. I came yep. to the bottom of the list in the end, but I knew what I could do. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. yeah. In that year of turnaround, obviously, I became the uh, Paralympic world champion and um, <laughs> I'm first gold medalist. Yeah, so, yeah. obviously, it gave me the push I really needed yeah. to, to leave it all out there on the track. Yeah. So, so if you've, as you mentioned there, uh, so that was at Rio 2016, was that correct? Um, the, the debut ride was 2015, so that was in, in Monte Chiari, I do believe. Right, okay. Uh, okay. Don't quote me on that. I know that it's one of them. I have a brain injury. That is my <laughs> more. So yeah. <laughs> well, you won. Did you won the? Um, so you, you you won gold in the build up into the 2016 Summer Paralympics, didn't you? In um, in Rio, and then you won the first gold on the on the day, did you? At the yes. at the par, at the uh, Rio Paralympics Games in the women's 3000 yeah. meters. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and then. You received your MBE uh, in 2017 in the New Year's Honours uh, for services to cycling. So you've, you've had some amazing, like, say, experiences uh, and you've had some amazing achievements as well. Um, however, I'm sure the, it's not come without, let's say, downsides to it as well. So can you just explain how you've kind of personally coped with, like, the, the peaks and troughs and the roller coaster of emotions of of kind of competing from from not being say selected or from just being a couple of seconds out from say like a, a bronze kind of medal how how does how does that work for you 
Yeah, well, so early on in my competing career, I had, like I said, I had nothing to lose. It was, right, it was okay. you know, I just did it. But yeah. once you reach the top of it as well, yeah. that's where the stress actually begins because suddenly you've got to stay there. You've got <laughs> everyone's chasing for that little bit of that glory. Yeah, and it's yeah. like, right, how do I do that? And when okay. I came out of Rio, I was like, I was on it. I was ready to go again. And yeah. then after that, I had a spate of in accidents and you know because i think before rio as well i brought i actually broke my back in a cycling accident wow so, okay yeah, and that was that was the year after my strokes that was 2014 october 2014 wow. um, and I, I missed out on nationals there as well but right okay the thing is is you have to have a really positive mindset and yeah. you, you have to know that the peaks and troughs are going to come. It's not always going to be at the top. You're never yeah. always going to be at the top. There's going to be down days and yeah. it's how you work with them. So I had to learn how to you how to manage my body and my fatigue levels. And okay. also the amount of exercise and training I was putting in and the amount of um, food I was having to put in and fluids. I had to really manage that and monitor that for my epilepsy as well, because the moment I had a seizure, I was off the bike again for a few days. And all right, that okay. training almost feels worth um, like it's a waste of, waste of time. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, man, no, I can't. And also, I didn't want to let my coach down. I was yeah. like, no. I need to be there. And I felt so, like I was disappointing other people. So you yeah. put a massive pressure on yourself. Okay. But for me, my real struggle was after Rio because I had a lot of, um, I had a few, a few bike accidents. And okay. in the run up to Tokyo, I missed out on a chance of going to Tokyo because I just wasn't fast enough anyway. Um, right. okay. But actually I got hit, I got hit with my bike, um, a car, a car pulled up alongside me at a red traffic light. Um, and then a rear passenger just came out the door and I went straight into the door, crumpled up, broke my knuckle bone. Wow. Um, broke my finger um a whole load of soft tissue damage but i missed out on worlds which was my selection for tokyo so wow. i couldn't go back to t tokyo to do you know what there's a part of me though how i reason it out is that we had covid going on yeah. and although tokyo was amazing bowl accounts i didn't yeah. watch any of it because i missed out on the opportunity and i couldn't cope with the emotions of that yeah. and okay. that's where my my big my my big downs in the sporting world was after being successful and then the roller coaster that happened afterwards yeah and how I dealt yeah. With that yeah um, okay I had a lot of um there was other things that were happening behind the scenes as well which created a, a, a juggling act of actually does cycling take priority now or do I now need to prioritize on this yeah so, yeah um my nephew ended up in care and right, okay he ended up and um, there was a big court bat um battle to get him out of care and Fortunately, we won and we we've got him home and he's safe and he wow. lives with us now. But he became my priority. Yeah, so okay. all of a sudden, all my winning and all my work that I did with cycling really yep. helped him to focus and see that actually, you know what, there can be some really crap times in your life. Yeah. And he he was only young. He was only far. Well, he's four four and a bit when he ended up in care. We got him out okay. at just five years old. Wow. Um, and he um you know he's done some amazing things and he's really developing as an individual yeah. um and i'm you know I, I, i'm even trying to push him into sports he's not really as sporty as me in that respect yet but right, he doesn't okay. like losing which is a good thing because <laughs> it would drive him to be the best eventually yeah, yeah. but it's allowing him to find it for himself yeah, um, yeah. so okay. my down days i really then had to focus on other things and other people and yeah. that that was incredibly difficult though because yeah. i had to change my whole mentality about me and my bike yeah. and all my focus is on my training to suddenly having to manage my time between all these other needs and wants and pulls from other people. Yeah. And yeah. I, I really struggled with that. And that really took my best, my mental health for a while. See, I, uh, and that's, so, and that's why we wanted to, to do this podcast because as a family of four children who are currently on that journey, uh, we didn't realize cause we've never been in that bubble, mm -hmm. how difficult it was going to be from, like the the kind of traveling to the training sessions to traveling to competitions or like kind of match days to the kind of fallouts um, with the children if um say results or they've not been performing as as we or kind of the coaches think they kind of should have been and then as a parent you're putting in like a lot of time and effort and we're we're not spending as much time together as as like what we'd kind of like to think we should be um if my wife's kind of traveling away with our eldest with her tennis we might not see each other for like a week or kind of two weeks and as I say like we thought we was doing something wrong and it was only through doing the podcast where we kind of listened to the stories from other athletes or kind of the backgrounds to, to how they got there and like the boys play football and they've been released from probably about three or four different football clubs now um, yeah. and they're only say um, 
11 and 12 um and like kind of mentally that does kind of affect them as well making making them like kind of question whether they're good enough um and whether it's something that they really want to like kind of do because they won't be able to say like go out and play with their friends in an evening because they might be training or they might need to go to bed early because they'll have like say a match um like say the the day after um so we didn't know whether this was like kind of a normal thing or whether this is what kind of typically happened and from from doing the podcast and we basically we wanted to shine a light on the 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 sacrifices that the the athletes um kind of go through to kind of make it to the top um and it's not just that kind of straight line to the top and it's not that instagrammable moment that you kind of see on social media um so we was hoping that we could kind of shine a light on for other parents that you know what the journey might be really really difficult but if you believe in it and you kind of trust the process um then with kind of stories um, like we kind of heard today and from other guests um, then it is quite kind of comforting and, and reassuring to kind of the parents um, who are listening at home. Um, so, so when you look back on um, your journey so far, um, both kind of positively uh, and negatively, physically and mentally, would you say climbing the mountain so far has been worth the view for you? Definitely, definitely. Like even now, I've been able to reframe and, and okay. start again. And when yeah. I say start again, I've used my skills and I've just transferred them across. So I've just been, um, I've just started shooting, target shooting. I was going to mention so, that to you. <laughs> yeah, and I'm using that to engage my little boy. So cool. uh, my little man, and yeah. he, you know, and he's he's like really focusing, seeing the the the, the amount of grit and determination that I have to go through things. And he came and watched one of my sessions, and I wasn't so sure about it. I was like, I'm in an hour, wow. and I was like. He's yeah. only eight years old. He's been for yeah. a rough time. Should I introduce this? And yeah. I thought I needed to go to a training session. It was during the holidays. I needed to go to a training session. I was like, if I don't do this, yeah. I'm never going to get back on track. And I need to start getting that that kind of like that a little bit of yeah routine in for me. Yeah. And I needed a bit of me back. Right. And I was like, oh, I'll take him along. I'll take his tablet. He can have some ear defenders on. He can just watch. Yeah. And he can be introduced to it gradually and just see what he thinks. And he did. And he sat there and he, he wasn't, he was unsure what to think. You know, right. kids, boys, especially. Yeah. Like, yeah, guns, blah, blah, blah. I want to shoot this. Do I do <laughs> this? You know, on these computer games. Yeah. And then we don't like, my little man hasn't really had the opportunity to do that because we won't allow it just to okay. his upbringing previously. Yeah, but yeah. this was an, a way of him seeing what I do behind the scenes because he never really got to see me cool. cycle too much. I yeah. was a toddler, he did. He came and yeah. watched me, but he didn't right. understand it then. Yeah. Um, and he loves cycling, so that's great. So we, right. we've got bikes and we go out together all the time yeah. in any weather. And I took him out in like a bit of a storm once, that, or we got caught in a storm, really. I didn't take yeah. him out of the storm. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing to watch it because he was like panicking. I was like, don't worry, just enjoy the journey. Oh, We're dealing nice. home. Let's focus. Yeah, yeah. Enjoy getting wet. Just take it in. Yeah, we'll yeah. sort it out when we get home. But him going there, actually, it also gave me a sense of pride. And actually, I'm not just doing it for me now. I'm yep. doing it for him. And I'm right. helping him see. But yeah, you know what? It can be tough. But if you want something and you really want something, once yep. you know what you want, yeah. go for it. Yeah, and if definitely. it doesn't work or you don't enjoy it, if you stop enjoying something, you've got to yeah. move on. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Right. So, um, so as the show comes to an end, um, we've had a tradition, and we've been asking all the guests if they've had any favourite quotes or philosophies that they've used along the way to get them where they are today. And one of our previous guests was Sophie Howard. So she plays for Leicester City and um, Scotland, and she said once she started something, um, she has to finish it, and she'd commit wholeheartedly to it. And she had a couple of um mental health issues when she was at uh, Reading and she said if if she hadn't have kind of committed wholeheartedly to it um, and not believed in what she'd kind of said then she wouldn't be where she was today so I was, I was just wondering whether you had any kind of famous or favorite quotes that you've kind of uh, that you've used along the way yeah I use, I use a quote I'm not what happened to me I'm what I choose to become right so, okay and that, that's the same for absolutely anyone you yeah. know we are not what happened to us. We're what we choose to become. And yep. it's, it's a, it is a matter of choice. And yep. sometimes we'll make the right choices and it will go swimmingly well. Sometimes we'll make the right choices and it'll go wrong. <laughs> sometimes we'll make the utter wrong choices yep. and keep making it. But hopefully eventually we learn. And right. it is a okay. choice. We have a choice. We, 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 we've got to empower ourselves to make those decisions to get to where we want to be. Yeah. And so that's why I do that. Yeah. Right. Okay. I like that one. I like that one. So, 
So finally, what's what's next on your journey? Are there any future kind of plans or projects we can look out for? I know you've I know you've mentioned um, about your shooting um, that you're trying to uh, progress in. Um, you've also got your own cycling academy. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I know the Nationals, have, I think you had a competition in October, was it? And have you got one in January as well? I think I remember uh, you saying. There is, uh, there is some competitions at the beginning of the new year. I'm just yeah. reevaluating where I'm at for that and whether I can um, attend right, okay. that. There's yeah. some, like a series. It's called a series. I'm still, I'm still learning about the competition rules and everything, so it's interesting. Right, and okay. Uh, with, with shooting, it's very different as well because obviously it's not physically, it's not as physical. It's more so that psychological, like a real mental focus. Yeah, yeah. Leaving. Um. So yeah, but with that, I have had a potential offer to um, go to Commonwealth Games. So I'm, I'm, oh. I'm at the moment. I'm looking at that. Cool. I can't say too much at the moment because obviously yeah. it's not guaranteed. And I don't want to jinx myself. <laughs> we're, we're all paranoid athletes out here, really. Yeah. Um, and then I'm I'm aiming for LA. Um, wow. Paris is too soon for me, and I don't yep. want to rush it. I want to enjoy the journey really more cool. than anything. Yeah. So I'm aiming for LA, and we'll see where it goes really with that. Oh, alongside that, wow. I'm writing a book. I'm setting up a new social media platform for people that have um have suffered at to the hands of um I say suffered, but yeah, anyone who's ha had um uh what's the word um. Sorry, I can't think. My, mind, my brain's going. That's mental. okay. But yeah, so basically, I'm setting up an online platform really to to go and give tips and tricks and discuss wow. and share and and share 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 training techniques as well for people that want to explore and you know yep. people that have suffered at the hands of adversity. And I say suffered. It's it's not suffering. Yes. It's something knocks you down, but actually it gives you a re it refocuses you and helps you um, explore it with other people that have been through similar situations. Yeah, and I think so I think again always... from quite a lot of the guests that we've had on um, who've either just come into the end of their professional career or they've been retired for a while. Um, they've got so many kind of transferable skills um, that they've kind of um, built up from their competitive. Um, kind of journey whether it be that resilience or the motivation or that that organization um um kind of framework that they have uh, that they're able to kind of put that into um a professional kind of background as well and there's there's so many experiences that the professional athletes have had that it's always amazing to hear that they can kind of pass that on to the next or future generation um, to allow them to be the, the say the best versions of themselves as they can yeah. be so it's, it's always nice when uh athletes like yourself kind of share that knowledge um almost with uh, with the future generation so so megan thank you so so much for being a guest on elite children a family portrait i'm i'm sure the listeners and the viewers at home can definitely see they're not alone in raising elite level children and over the past months we've been overwhelmed by the the number of um, professional athletes that have been open and honest enough to share such resilient and motivating and inspirational stories that we can all use in our daily lives. Um, so thank you so, so much for adding to that today. Um, good luck with any future ventures and projects you're involved with. Um, and I'm sure with a mindset and a personality like yours, there'll be, there'll be a huge, huge success. Um, so Megan Gillier, uh, thank you so, so much for being a guest on Elite Children, A Family Portrait. Thank you for having me. It's been great. No problem. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.